I think stories are really, really important. So I'm not just going to put a definition of chaos engineering up on the screen. Uh, I will actually in a few slides, um, but I want to tell you the story of it first. I want to tell you how we got here, give you the context for what led to this, uh, this practice, this approach. Uh, and like most stories in our industry, uh, this starts with Netflix. Uh, 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 starts about 2011. So 2011, Netflix were moving to the cloud. So they were going from uh, one provider, one data center to public cloud, to commercial cloud, uh, AWS specifically. Uh, and as they were doing this, they weren't just copy pasting their big application. They went from one big application, what we today would call a monolith, uh, and they were taking small chunks of that functionality and deploying them as independent services in AWS what we would today call microservices. They were doing the monolith to microservices transition. And as they started doing this, they realized they didn't really know how to do this. Um, breaking big things into small things had been done before. It continues to be done, of course. Uh, but doing it at Netflix scale, handling one third of all US downstream traffic, um, that was kind of new. So they came up with the Netflix engineering principles, the ways, the things they needed to do to get this right. And one of the first principles they figured out is that no service should be a single point of failure. When you go to, from one application to hundreds of applications living in the cloud, hundreds of independent services, if one of those services fails and causes the whole system to go down, you have a major problem. You've just gone from one point of failure to potentially hundreds and thousands of points of failure. This cannot happen. You cannot have, you cannot build a system with single points of failure. In fact, this is such an important principle that their second principle is to never ever trust that they got the first principle right. And they built a tool around 2011, they built a tool that would help them validate that they got number one right, to help them validate that they're doing number two. Uh, and that tool is Chaos Monkey. So if you've heard of Chaos Engineering, you've probably heard of Chaos Monkey. What Chaos Monkey does is it looks at Netflix's production cluster, looks at all of their microservices, and it starts turning them off randomly. And they run this 9 to 5. They run this in office hours. Uh, whenever there are Netflix engineers in the building, they are running Chaos Monkey. They are randomly killing services. This is a business decision they made. They made the choice, they made the decision that it is better to be in a constant state of minor failure than very occasionally in a state of catastrophic failure. That had happened to them before. A few years before this, uh, all of Netflix went down for almost four days, including their DVD uh, delivery service. Everything crashed. They said it is better that Chaos Monkey is constantly causing minor annoyance rather than occasionally very publicly failing in a really, really big way. They didn't stop there. They actually built many, many monkey-themed tools Talk about a few. We're not going to talk, talk about all of them. If you want to get very technical, not all of these are uh, chaos engineering tools. I really like Latency Monkey. What Latency Monkey does is it injects very small delays <laughs> into network requests. So a network request from one service to another service that used to take 20 milliseconds now takes 200 milliseconds or two seconds or 20 seconds. Is your system resilient to those kind of network degradations? Are your timeouts set correctly? This is Chaos Monkey's big brothers, Chaos Gorilla and Chaos Kong. They simulate partial and complete failures uh, of entire AWS availability zone. This is a uh, Netflix monitoring tool. Look at this error rate in the center. This is the, the, the total uh, percentage of uh, error uh, of, of, of requests that come in. What percentage of those cause errors? And you see what's happening here is they're simulating a failure of uh, an entire availability zone. See, it's going red here, and their error rate is going up. See, a lot of, lot of red dots there. Each of these dots is a request, an incoming message from the outside world. Uh, and you'll see that they're uh, redirecting them. So they're redirecting from uh, US West to US East. Yes, their error rate is going up, but the system is adapting. The system is responding appropriately to this. And ultimately, as this uh, error rate here goes down again, they're testing that the system is able to recover and get back to its original state, that it will, uh, we'll see very soon, that error rate's going down and it will start redirecting messages in the right way. <coughs> they're validating 
that they do not have a single point of failure. They're validating that they are building a system that is able to respond to failure appropriately. And after doing this for a couple of years, they realized that they had invented something. And they retroactively called it chaos engineering. The first of their tools was called Chaos Monkey. And they retroactively came up with these principles of chaos engineering. You can find them down at principlesofchaos.org. And they said, OK, the first thing you want to do here, if you want to do chaos engineering, is you need to define a steady state, some measurable output of your system that indicates normal, be normal behavior. That's, the, that's that error count that was in the center of the screen earlier. They're saying, if our system is working correctly, your error count will be below 1%. If it is above that, we are no longer in our steady state. We have failed to uh, be a working system. And then you're going to make a hypothesis. You're going to say, if we have built a resilient system, then whatever we throw at it, it's going to stay, it's going to keep doing that. It's going to keep in that steady state. And then they start introducing variables. Some people call these chaos variables. This is chaos monkey. They're going to start turning things off randomly. They're going to start injecting network delays. They're going to start injecting failures. And then they're going to try and disprove that hypothesis. They're going to look back and they say, did things break? A lot of words here. Some of you in the back might not be able to see the bottom one, so I'm just going to simpl simplify it down. First of all, you just want to make sure that your system is working. Have some way of answering the question, are we good? Are we fine? Then you try and break it. Then you actively introduce these failure modes and check to see if it broke. I keep repeating this. You learn as you go. Uh, I'm a millennial, so I like pictures and GIFs, so I'm going to go back to this. Have some monitoring. Have something in place that tells you if your system is working. And then you just introduce a chaos variable. You try and break things. Figure out if your system's working, try and break it, and try and learn from that. You know, it's core. You need two things here. Just a way of validating that the system's working, and a way of inducing failures. Now, there's a question that comes up a lot here, which is, isn't this just stress testing? How is this different from just stress testing, just throwing a lot of load at the system? I think there are some important differences. First of all, there's a focus on real world failure modes. Hard disks fail, CPUs fail, RAM fails, server rooms catch fire. Was one of your microservices in this server room? Will it be in the next server room fire? It's not always the hardware, the servers themselves either. Uh, it can be the network, the connections between them. Cat5 cables fail. Undersea cables are attacked by sharks. We have to wrap them in Kevlar. They're very high voltage, which sharks uh, interpret as a fish, apparently. So there we go. Uh, it's not just sharks, either. Sometimes it's uh, people digging for copper. I think we spend a lot of time concerning ourselves about whether or not we are vulnerable to hackers. We don't think about whether or not we're vulnerable to Georgian women. <laughs> this is the world we live in, where everything fails all of the time. This is Werner Vogels. This is the guy trying to sell you AWS. And he, even he admits that everything fails all of the time. That's quite honest. Uh, I like that. The reality of the world we live in is that, uh, is that the failure of a computer you did not even know existed can ruin your whole day, can render your system useless. I like this. I think that chaos engineering, at its core, is a very honest approach to engineering. It is honest about the world in which we live. We also see a big uh, decoupling of cause and effect here. Most testing suites, traditional testing, unit testing, functional testing, you can see exactly the line that caused the failure. This test failed because I put in this output, I expected that output, and I got a different output. Here, we see a failure in one data center might cause a failure on the other side of the world, which means there's a much bigger focus on monitoring. We need to be able to understand the system. We need to be able to answer that question, are we good? So I think chaos engineering is cool, but should you be investing here? This is the question. Uh, there are no good decisions. There are always trade-offs, OK? If you are going to choose, choosing to invest in chaos engineering means you are choosing not to invest somewhere else. So should you? be investing here? I think the answer to that question, helpfully answered by this guy, this is uh, Dave Snowden, and he came up with a Kinevin framework. Kinevin framework is an approach, a way of understanding the world. It's meant for decision makers, meant to help us inform how we decide, how we uh, make choices in the world. Uh, and it divides the world into four. These are, very, these are not categories. Dave Snowden is very, very clear to say these are not categories. These are soft distinctions. But you might find yourself in a very, very simple context. 
Some situations are simple. Cause and effect are very, very understood. A uh, good example of this would be a uh, delivery company. If a package comes in and it's labeled urgent, you put it in this pile. If a package comes in and it's a local delivery, you put it in this pile. If you, a package comes in and it's an international delivery, you put it in pile C. Very, very simple. This is the kind of world which can be understood, which can be uh, described with rules. It's the kind of world that can be understood by a small child. You look at the world, you categorize it, you understand what rule applies here, and then you apply it. Best practice is fine here. Not everything is simple, obviously. Some things are a little bit more complicated. Complicated contexts have lots of details, lots of moving parts. Great examples of this would be a skilled surgeon doing a routine operation, or an experienced engineer taking apart a car. Lots of details. I couldn't do either of those but they're manageable. Cause and effect exist here, but everything is a little bit harder. So you have to look at the world, you have to analyze it, you have to figure out, you have to apply your experience, apply your expertise, and then figure out what to do. There's still good practice, don't hit the car with a big mallet, but this isn't really the kind of world that can be explained with a flowchart. Some things get fully complex though. Complex situations are characterized by an inter interlocking web of cause and effect. Lots and lots of moving parts. Very, very difficult to understand. In fact, may not be fully understandable. Classic examples of this would be uh, ecosystems, would be markets. I can tell you that if I take a tree out of a rainforest, something is going to change. I can't tell you what exactly is going to happen. I can tell you that if Apple goes bankrupt tomorrow, something is going to happen to the markets. Something is going to happen to this complex system. I cannot tell you what, and I don't think anyone could. I can't take a tree out of a system and study it in isolation because it's a complex system. We can only understand it as a whole, this inter interlocking web of cause and effect. What we do here is we probe. We have to probe the system, see how it responds, and then we respond to that. Emergent behavior works quite well here. Some situations that are chaotic, these are disasters. These are natural disasters or terrorist attacks. What you do here is you, you really just have to act to impose order. Then you can step back, then you can understand the system a little bit more. Then you can apply these novel approaches. This is meant for decision makers. This is a, this is a framework meant for decision makers. Uh, a management style that works really, really well in a chaotic environment, if you apply that to a simple environment, is going to fail completely. That's just going to stress everyone out. A leader that does well in one is, may, not well, may not do well in another. A leader, a top-down manager, who does very, very well in a simple environment, is going to fail completely in a complex environment. This is meant to inform how you approach decisions, how you manage a team, how you think about the world. This is a, a monitoring tool called Visceral, it's built by Netflix. Uh, it's showing a subset of their microservices, the little dots here, are messages being sent between these services. Red ones are errors and all this. We can see this web of uh, messages being sent. This is a complex system. This is an inter interlocking web of cause and effect. I cannot take out one of these services and study it in isolation. It only makes sense to understand this system as a whole. Nobody at Netflix understands this whole system. There may be a manager, there may be uh, engineers who understand one or two or three or four or five or ten of these services. Nobody understands every single microservice in Netflix. If you ever go to a Netflix tech talk, one question that always comes up is how many microservices do you have? Netflix is famous for microservices and the, and the answer is always about 500. Nobody in Netflix knows exactly how many microservices they have. Nobody in Netflix fully understands this system. This is a classic characteristic of a complex environment, of a complex scenario. And what chaos engineering is doing is allowing them to understand that. Nobody at Netflix understands every single microservice, but they do have confidence that if any one of those microservices fails, the system as a whole is going to continue functioning. This is what chaos engineering is for. 
Chaos engineering is bringing understanding to a, to a system that fundamentally is not understandable. For wrangling with these complex systems that I think many of us find ourselves working with. I think this is a really important thing to think about. How do we move around here? Chaos engineering, ironically, is not really for dealing with chaotic sy systems. Put out the fire first. But we can start thinking about other transitions, other contexts here. Uh, who's read this article? Really, really catchy title. It's a very good article. The Log, What Every Software Engineer Should Know About Real-Time Data's Unifying Abstraction, describes the architecture at LinkedIn a few years ago. You had all of these data producers and all of these data consumers, each of these services. And every single time someone added a service, every single time a new team added a new service, they were responsible for building the integration, all of the integrations with all those other services. This system was growing in complexity very, very rapidly. Every single time you added one more service, you had to ha add n more connections for each of those other services you wanted to integrate with. That growth in complexity was slowing them down. That growth in complexity was becoming unmanageable. So they moved to this. They moved to a single unified log. Every single service communicated through this unified log. The unified log, by the way, is Kafka. This article is about how and why Kafka was invented, which is it's an interesting article. You should read it. Unified logging was about controlling that growth of complexity. It did not remove it. It did not snap its fingers and make it go away. But it was a tool for helping them manage that growth of complexity and manage that system as a whole. Everyone remembers code freeze, right? They were from the 90s. They were really cool in the 90s. Okay? Code freeze just says stop. Stop exactly where you are. Touch nothing. <laughs> because if everything else stays the same, you will gradually move clockwise. You will gradually become, you will gradually shift to a simpler context. You've all started on a project, started working with something, and thought, this is really, really hard. And a few weeks, a few months later, you've realized it's still hard, but it's a bit more understandable. That's what code freeze is for. It's for allowing you to pull things back. But the reality is most systems aren't frozen. An evolving software system increases in complexity unless work is done to reduce it. That's the really key bit there. This is the second law of thermodynamics, but with the word software in it, right? You know how Silicon Valley, just every couple of weeks, reinvents public transport or houses, um, and they're really proud of themselves? We've done it with physical laws now. As systems evolve, they increase in complexity. Chaos engineering is a tool for managing that increase in complexity. Um, so the question I would ask if you are thinking about chaos engineering is where are you today? But actually I would ask another question, is where are you going to be tomorrow? Are you a microservices system adding microservices every week, every couple of days? I've been in those teams before. We were very, very rapidly becoming more complex. Chaos engineering was a very, very relevant tool for us then. I've also been in tools consolidating microservices. Three microservices became one. Two microservices became one. It was less relevant there because we were reigning in that complexity in other ways. So this is the question I would ask. Where are you going to be tomorrow? How is your system growing in complexity? Chaos engineering is a tool for managing that. How would you actually get started with chaos engineering? So chaos toolkit is one approach. Um, full disclosure, I do know one of the guys who, um, who sort of started this project. It's a, uh, a way of sort of codifying these, uh, these experiments, these chaos experiments, all within one framework. You can define these in, uh, in JSON form. First of all, you've got your steady state hypothesis. What does it mean for your application to be working? In this case, it's just saying this particular application will respond with a 200, nice and simple. Then you can define your chaos variable. What does it, how are you going to break it? Here, you're just swapping out an expired certificate. This is a failure that's going to happen to you at some point happened to me many, many times. And it very conveniently also allows you to define your rollback, so how you undo that damage that you did with that, uh, with that chaos variable you threw in. This allows you to really codify these experiments. I like this because it puts these concepts right together. But I also don't like it because it puts these concepts right together. And actually, I think it shifts <coughs> the focus, puts the focus in the wrong way, in, the, in, in kind of the wrong place. I think that there is a little bit of a problem in the chaos engineering community, to be honest. There are hundreds of tools. There are thousands of articles on how to get started with Chaos Monkey. We have an obsession with Chaos Monkey. It's got a very funny name. We like Chaos Monkey. But I think that this is the wrong place to start. We have an obsession with monkeys. 
There's a really good article by our boy Martin Fowler. You must be this tall to use microservices. The bar here is continuous delivery. The bar here is mature DevOps, is a team that is comfortable releasing rapidly, is rapid hardware provisioning, rapid software provisioning, a lightweight change approval process. If you don't have those things, you should not be doing microservices. If you try to do microservices without meeting that bar, you are going to fail. It's tough to say, but it is. It's absolutely true. And the reality is there is a bar for chaos engineering as well. If you try and jump straight into Chaos Monkey without meeting that bar, you are going to fail. I think that bar is monitoring. I think that bar is having visibility on your system. There are a great many tools that can do this. Big fan of Grafana myself. Most of these are Grafana dashboards. There are APM tools. There's log aggregators like Splunk. There's CloudWatch. There's, there's a great many tools. I'm not going to tell you which one's right for you. But you need some way of answering the question, are we good? Because if you aren't able to do that, you need to invest further. If you aren't able to answer the question, are we good? Who, which of you can answer that question right now? Which of you can open your phone, open your laptop, and tell me if your production system is fine? That's the question you need to be answering before you start investing in chaos engineering. And when you do, there are thousands of tools, as mentioned. Chaos Slinger, I believe, is a, is a, is a, is a security-focused tool. Pumba, I think, is a uh, Docker-focused tool. Gremlin, uh, I think, is a chaos as a service, is what I've, uh, I've heard it described as. Haven't actually used it myself. Simian Army, obviously, one of the oldest of the, uh, uh, one of the, oldest of the tools. Uh, one of the oldest sort of set of chaos engineering tools, very mature. Big, big, long lists, not very difficult to find. Um, I probably wouldn't recommend you get started with Chaos Monkey, actually. I think uh, it's a very mature tool, very, very powerful, yes. But it also has some dependencies on Netflix's infrastructure. So if you are not using uh, Spinnaker, some of Netflix's tooling, uh, current versions of Chaos Monkey are off the table for you, which, yeah. Again, maybe you are, maybe that's fine for you. Personally, if you're, at least if you're in AWS, I would probably recommend you get started here from the lovely people at uh, artillery.io bringing you that, that very nice tool. It's a very, very lightweight Lambda. The pitch is you can get started with Chaos Engineering in about 15 minutes. You, uh, by default, it does nothing. You just need to give it the permissions to turn off any service it wants. And then you pass a JSON file with uh, any, uh, any auto-scaling groups you wanted to start targeting. Very, very lightweight uh, way of getting started. Obviously, a bit of a non-starter if you're not on AWS. My, my absolute favorite chaos engineering tool is cross-cloud, so it doesn't matter whether you're on uh, Azure, or Google Cloud, or AWS. Uh, it's going into your dashboard and just stopping things. Drop a database. This is chaos engineering so simple, most of you have probably done this by accident. Who's dropped a production database? I have. I did, a few, I did it a few weeks ago. It was a great way of learning. If you really, really want to test your, your, the observability of your system, whether or not your system is able to, uh, whether or not your system, and that, by which I mean your whole team, is able to detect, react to, and recover from failure modes, do this without telling anyone. Go into work tomorrow. Just delete a, delete a database. Drop a database. Turn off an instance of something. That's chaos engineering. Thank you. <laughs>